Hey, New Covenant. How is everyone today? Good. I have to tell you, I was just so blessed looking around this morning and everybody's heart of worship. Like, thank you. Thank you for being present. I actually was away this week at um, once a quarter. I go to a transforming community, this learning community that we go to at a, um, at a seminary and we're kind of set aside from the world for three days. It's a, um, a just over 100 um, pastors and Christian leaders from across the country. And this is the first time we kind of go through these rhythms where we're in silence or solitude or just solitude and practicing other disciplines. And and then we come together as a community and then we go back to ourselves in this beautiful back and forth thing. And I was so struck this week as we stood together in this old, very small chapel. And it was the first time we could all sing and it just, oh man, I just had this, I don't know, I just imagine what heaven's going to be like. Music and, and glorifying God and hallelujah and amen and all of those beautiful voices raised together. And so I just, as I looked around this morning, I, I just saw that heart of worship in our church, and I am so thankful. So um, online, we are glad that you're with us, and we know that it's maybe not quite the same. You miss some of that, uh, the voices all together raised, but man, what a gift to be with you this morning. So thank you, everybody. And we were kind of convicted last night. Um, we were at the Smoky Hill campus for service last night, and we had a missionary from South Africa come, and he was sharing how they don't get to gather yet. And it broke my heart. I just went, oh, the gift of being the body together. Did you feel that this morning? Man, it just sometimes moments like that just kind of um, change our perspective, right? If we haven't met yet, my name is Christy and I am one of the pastors here. We are so glad that you're with us this morning to worship. And um, we are continuing in this series on what it means to live by the Spirit. So in Galatians, specifically in Galatians 5, we've talked about kind of the flesh versus the spirit and the nature of that battle that's ongoing. We've talked about love and joy and viewing all of it through the lens of love. And today I will be talking about peace and patience. And I kind of chuckled thinking, I wonder why I got this instead of Mike and Sean. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Clearly Amelia should be up here. (laughs) So... (laughs) So just a reminder, all of the fruit of life by the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when we think about the battle of the flesh, Galatians 5, 16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Now, this idea of battle, most of us are pretty familiar, if we're honest, if we spend any time being aware of our own lives, right? Maybe it's the battle between, I really wanted to eat that whole package of Oreos, and yet I ate a chicken salad, which felt not as gratifying. Or maybe it's, I wanted to be in the Word, but oh man, then that Netflix, like that series that I've been watching kind of sucked me in and maybe I, I battled and I, I went there instead or maybe, oh goodness, there's so many things, right? I want to speak with wholesome goodness and sometimes gossip and slander is what comes out of my mouth or I lack peace and patience with my children, right? Has anyone ever been there on a daily basis? Maybe, maybe it's just me. I love, thank you. I'm so edified that some of you raised your hand to stand in solidarity. Thank you. But we live in this culture that focuses on Paul's, kind of his, his admonition in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 that says, everything is permissible for me. Everything, right? And we live in a culture that says, yes, not only is everything permissible, but let me sell it to you. I'm gonna make it really easy at your very fingertips to grab hold of whatever it is that everything that is permissible, right? And in fact, sometimes this can be really encouraging. Uh, This week I was finding some hysterical pictures on the internet of she believed she could and so she did, right? And this is encouraging and I think sometimes we need to be reminded that in Christ we can do all things, right? So there's this great picture. Let me just give you the context. This little girl standing with this board and she's in a room and, and she's very cute. She's holding the board and it says, so she believes she could and so she did. But I think what gets missed in our culture is actually the second half of that verse, 1 Corinthians six twelve, where it says, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. 
And if you pan out on this picture, this adorable girl in her like really cutely decorated room, what you actually see is she believed she could and so she did, and now she's in timeout. <laughs> right? That resonated with something in my heart and in my spirit that I went, oh Lord, this is the flesh versus the spirit. She believed she could, so she did, and now she's in timeout. Verse 17 says, they, the flesh, and the spirit are in conflict with each other so that we are not to do whatever we want, but if we are led by the spirit, we are not under the law. All things are possible. Not all things are beneficial. I love the visual that Sean gave us a few weeks ago where he said, a, a tree isn't up here going, oh, make the fruit happen. Like, uh, is it there yet? No. Where's the orange? Nope. Where's the apple, right? And I began to think of this picture of a tree. And I imagine trees are so symbolic of you. If you've ever had like um, big trees, when I was a kid, we used to go pick up walnuts and like your hands turn bright yellow, and they're, but they're these massive trees. And I was reminded of that actually this week as I was out walking around the lake at the seminary and the, the way that the, just these massive trees grow. And I thought about the seasons of the production of fruit for a tree, right? We can't, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we can't stand and go, let it just show up. Like, am I more loving? Not really. Am I more peaceful? Mm, not so much because that orange won't show up, right? But trees, they just are with what they are, right? And with what the season is. And if you think about in the fall time, if you imagine a tree, you can close your eyes if that helps to think about maybe a tree in your history that's been sim symbolic or one that was in your yard or maybe used to go on walks and see and maybe used to climb one when you were a kid. And you think about in fall, how the leaves begin to shrivel and dry, right? And they begin to make a lot of noise, but it's not noise of life and, and springtime. It's kind of noise of, of death and of a letting go. Because as the wind picks up and begins to pull those leaves off the branches, the tree has to learn to let go, and, and it sometimes feels very barren and looks very barren, right? And then maybe the, the snow moves in and the cold moves in, and winter begins to kind of shut everything down, and it, and it looks like this tree is dead and barren with no life. And yet, what happens in that season is this deep, deep growth of roots that are going to provide the sustenance that the tree needs, the strength, not just to draw food, but to stand in the midst of those storms. And then spring, the wind lessens, the snow lessens, the sun begins to come out, the temperature's warm, and you begin to see life reemerge on a tree, right? And you see the leaves and, and the beginning of, of buds on a tree, and then later in spring, the flowers come and the bloom, and the animals, the little bees come and pollinate, and, and then eventually there's fruit, right? And when I think of that picture of a tree, too often in our culture, we're like, I want the orange and I want it now, so Lord, come on, like, Still not there. And there's this beautiful thing of seasonalities, of letting go, of trusting that there's organic, natural growth that's coming and things that are being grown and made and matured in us that we may not necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis, but eventually the fruit comes. So that's this whole process of where I think, okay, I'm more like this little girl who thought she could and she did and now she's in time out then I tend to be like this tree that naturally embraces the seasons that come and allow the Lord to work out the things in me. Does that picture resonate for anyone else? Don't we want just a fast food version of our spirituality? 19 and 22, the acts of the flesh are obvious, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So as part of this series, we're trying to take a look at people's lives and, and share stories as we consider how do others live out fruit? How do we see the fruit of the Spirit in others' lives? And today, I want to introduce you to a woman by the name of Susanna. We're going to pray. Father, we invite you to come. Speak to us this morning, Lord. Speak to us where our tendency is to run ahead in the flesh, Father, instead of maybe doing the long, slow walk that the fruit of your spirit has to grow and develop and produce in us. I just, Lord, I ask that you would speak to our hearts about peace and about patience, Father, and about practices that bring us into a place of, of nourishing soil 
standing strong and still, Lord, to, to believe that even when we don't fully see it yet, that you will produce the fruit that you promise and that you say that you will. Lord, have your way with our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So what of peace? This woman, Susanna, she's a woman who lived in an incredible amount of upheaval and chaos in her life. And I'm gonna just kind of walk through the story of, of her experiences in her life. She was the very youngest daughter of a family of 25 kids, okay, who was born to a reverend and his wife, Mary, Reverend Samuel Ainsley, and Susanna was the 25th. Now, I don't know, sometimes as a third kid, I'm like, I didn't get enough attention, right? Can you imagine 25th of 25 kids? Like, this is her context. I think that gives us enough context of her early childhood. But she's the youngest daughter. Um, she then went on to marry her, her father, actually, real quick for the context around him being a reverend. He um, was pastoring in a time that was full of incredible religious upheaval, where um, the government was coming down saying, you can only believe and teach and follow the government church's teaching. Okay? And so he and about a thousand other pastors stood up and said, we won't do this. We won't do this. And, and therefore, he lost his job, his position as a pastor. And, and obviously, with 25 children, significant financial hardship fell upon this family. So Susanna grows up. She goes on to marry at the age of 19. Her husband, who, by the way, is also named Samuel, which is interesting. He had finished his studies at Oxford. He also went on to become a, a pastor, a rector. And so he kind of started as an assistant pastor and then he became a Navy chaplain. And, and in fact, while he was deployed, while he was on the ship as a chaplain, they were so poor she was now pregnant with their first child and had to move into someone else's home to live because their finances were so tight. So this is kind of a, you know, her early childhood, her early marriage years, pretty intense. So she moves in, lives with another family. Eventually her husband comes back. They move into her parents' home while they have their first child, but then finances are still very, very tight for them and they end up moving back into someone else's home and living there with their young family. There's later employment difficulties and this, this young family has more children arrive. A daughter arrives within a few years, another daughter born that next same year, but she passed away at just a few months of old. The following year, twin sons were welcomed into their family. They also passed away at just a few young months of age. The next year, Susanna lost her, her father. She later lost her brother in a very weird and, and mysterious disappearance where he was coming to travel, his things made it, and he never did. The next five years brought the birth of three more of their daughters. Suki, Mary, and Hetty, followed by another set of twins, a boy and a girl this time, both of whom died shortly after birth. On and on this goes. The next five year brought, years brought, um, like I said, the, the other three daughters, their two boys, another set of twins that passed away. All in all, Susanna had 10 children, seven boys and three girls, and nine children that she lost. Nine. You add to that the loss of her father, the loss of her brother. I mean, the grief and the experience that this woman walked through was so intense. And I think what of peace in the midst of circumstances that are so heartbreaking and chaotic and out of control, what of peace in those circumstances? And if you look in the dictionary, peace is defined as a noun, the normal non-warring condition of a nation, a state of mutual harmony between people or groups, the normal freedom from civil commotions and violence of a community, public order and security. This is peace. And yet, when I think about peace, I think of it in a very personal way, right? This is very much between people groups or um, countries or nations and, and things that you can expect to live in peace, right? Which, I mean, frankly, we don't experience a lot in our world. But I tend to think of peace as a far more personal, experiential thing right? When I think of peace, I think of a, a feeling of just well-being and of, oh, I can rest and I can, I can be still and know that he is God, right? That's my, my thought of peace. And so, of course, I go, what of peace in the Bible? What is the biblical definition? Because, of course, dictionary definitions are helpful, but 
Of course, we should be taking that to the word. These are just a few of my favorite scriptures about peace, and I'm going to run through them quickly and just share what they speak to me. And you can spend some time this week if you want to, like, snap a picture, or it's probably, I don't know, we can make it available somehow. If you want to kind of spend some time in these scriptures on peace, and later we'll have some on patience, and maybe jot down a few as they speak to your heart. Matthew 10, 13, this is as the disciples were sent out. And it says, if the home is worthy as they go into these towns, if it's worthy, let your peace rest upon it. And if it's not, let your peace return to you. So we are, the word tells me, I, I take this to me, we, are, we can be agents of peace. We get to choose to bring our peace and to bless others with our peace, right? James 3.18 says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. There's a blessing that comes when we choose to be those that bring peace. And there's really cool stuff that comes to us as well, righteousness, right? Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit. God is the very author, the giver, the initiator of the peace in our lives. He's the one, he's it. And when we trust in him and in that, we then begin to reflect that to the world. 1 Corinthians 1, 3 and 2 Corinthians 1, 2, we're greeted with this grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, pointing to the authorship of Jesus as our source of peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This one feels a little different to me, right? It reminds us that peace is not something that is made by or offered in the world. What we're more likely to find is escapist stuff that helps us kind of numb out some of those things, right? When I'm feeling a lack of peace and I, I go and I distract myself with something on my computer or my email and, and I, or I watch something or I have a conversation or I do those things rather than being present, in that lack of peace. I'm looking for things that are never going to bring me true peace. Right? They're, the world does not make peace when we're concerned about the worldly things that actually generates fear in us, right? 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Now may the Lord of peace himself go, I'm sorry, give you peace at all times and in every way. So we can receive peace. And then my favorite out of Philippians 4, 4 through 7, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have you ever had a chance to experience that kind of peace? So let's go back to the story of Susanna, this woman who has kind of a chaotic, a large family, a lot of loss, a lot of grief. Ten years into their marriage, Susanna's husband decides he's going to take on a new bivocational role and he's going to become a farmer in addition to being a pastor. But a businessman, he was not. And he went into significant debt. So much so that imagine how much you make in a year as a family, one and a half times his annual salary. He went into debt in these kind of ill pursuits of something to provide. His heart wasn't wrong, but again, he sought perhaps the wrong thing. As a result, her husband fell into a significant depression. And in this desperate place, Samuel abandons his wife, his children, and his church. He leaves his congregation, he leaves his family, and he disappears. Not because of his depression or the financial hardships, but because his wife, Susanna, refused to say amen to one of his prayers and refused to agree with him. Now, obviously, the depression and the stress and the financial pieces clearly uh, clouded his judgment, right? But this woman, boy, her expectations, whoo, they have not been met, have they? So he leaves his wife, these 10 children, 
Now, the good news is he did eventually return, but the reason for his return is a little more tragic too. Their house burned to the ground, almost killing one of their young daughters in his absence. So he returns and he comes and he helps to rebuild the home, reestablishes the family, And then he begins to get a little bit overly connected in some of the political stuff of the day. And so he aligns himself with a particular political candidate that, as it turns out, did not hold his same beliefs about God or about faith or about the church. And so then he had to disentangle himself from his religion or his um, political affiliation. But this created all kinds of drama and harassment for their family to the point where the kids were being harassed, their livestock was being stabbed, their family dog was almost killed. And eventually... (laughs) I mean, this is like stuff out of like a really bad soap opera, right? You cannot make this stuff up. And I'm not making this stuff up. This is a biography of Susanna's life. Things became so bad with his political enemies that they burnt his house to the ground a second time. This time, literally taking out everything they owned. And so he begins to rebuild for their family with brick instead of wood. I mean, this, what of peace. And what of patience in a story like this. The dictionary says that patience is the quality of being patient. I feel like this woman might literally be the dictionary definition of patience, the bearing of provocation, annoyance, misfortune, or pain without complaint. An ability or willingness to suppress restlessness or annoyance when confronted with delay and quiet, steady perseverance, even tempered care and diligence. What does the Bible say about patience? Again, these are some of my favorite scriptures because I find myself when I read something like this wondering, How do you hold on to peace and patience in that? James 5.10, brothers and sisters, is an example of patience in the face of suffering. I think this points to the fact that we, we actually have an opportunity to witness the things of God in the face of our suffering. Hebrews 6.12, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Then you will not become spiritually dull or indifferent. Faith and patience become this mechanism through which we receive the inheritance that the Lord has for us. Matthew 18, 26, and the servant fell on his knees before him. Have patience with me, he begged, and I will pay you everything. We see patience, this cry for mercy and suffering to be lifted for this man who's in serious debt. Romans 2, 4 challenges us. Do we disregard the riches of his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience? Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, recognizing and responding to the patience that is in our very creator can be a form of our sanctification. Not just sanctification, but 2 Peter 3, 15 reminds us to consider also the Lord's patience brings salvation, sanctification and salvation. Oh, he's so patient with me when I'm in time out. 2 Corinthians 6, 6, we prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, and our kindness. Are you guys seeing all the fruit that we're talking about from 522 is all over scripture as a reflection of the, the things that we as followers of Jesus should be reflecting to the world, the things that we have the opportunity to receive from our Father God in the midst of chaos, in the midst of unmet expectations in the midst of abandonment and rejection and disappointment in the world. Second Corinthians 12, 12 says, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Again, we see God's very nature of patience opens the door to his signs and wonders and miracles happening. This is pretty incredible stuff. And it's so counter-cultural. Peace and patience. Man, I I don't know about you, but I feel like I totally have missed it with my kids, right? Like, gosh, what? I forgot to teach them about peace and patience. Man. Here's a few more of Susanna's peaceful and patient experiences. She homeschooled all of her children, all of her 10, including her daughters, which at that time was um, pretty unusual. 
and she didn't like the resources that she found, so she went ahead and wrote her own textbooks. <laughs> she didn't find those available meta standards, so she wrote one that first was about the nature of the universe, and she intended to um, help the children understand how it pointed to God as the creator, and how then they could use that, they could use reason and intellect to equip them to analyze those objections to their faith. She then wrote her own exposition of the Apostles' Creed and yet another on the exploration of the Ten Commandments that she might train her children in the ways of the Lord. 22 years into their marriage, they had, um, uh, as her husband was pastoring, an assistant pastor who came and when her husband was traveling or doing other things, he would step in and speak. Now this church did not appreciate the teaching team like we have here at NCC. They didn't really like this guy and they didn't like the way he taught. And so what would happen is a lot of them would actually just skip church on those days. Well, Susanna began to gather her family and her household together and, and they would read the sermons that either her father or her husband had written when her husband was out of town. And she would begin these gatherings. And what started as just her family in Sunday afternoons began to grow. And instead of going to church, the whole congregation would come to Susanna's home to listen. And then can you imagine what happened? That assistant pastor was pretty offended by that. Right? So he began to accuse her of the legal meetings that she was having as a woman speaking. Oh my goodness. Tried to get her husband to come back and, and shut it down. I mean, this woman has been through the ringer, right? But one of the most dramatic examples of how busy, chaotic, and crazy their family was, was that her sign, and I, I recently was reading a biography by, this is, a lot of this is out of Eric Metaxas's book, Seven Women. Susanna would sit down in the middle of her house, pull her apron up, and throw it over her head, and an effort to find peace, okay? So her children knew, if you found mom like this, <laughs> okay, you better shut your mouth, let her find some peace. 10 kids, just imagine, I mean, it's really funny. Like, where's mom? Oh, never mind, never mind. She's trying to find some peace, right? So this leads me to the question, not just our experiences, but what of our practices? Are we in our own lives sitting down, shutting the world out, throwing our heads right in the middle of to grab hold of peace? And what I'm sure she needed was patience. What of the practices in our own lives? Of her faith, Susanna was said to rarely miss an evening appointment with the Lord. That's what her children reported of her. She never missed her appointment with the Lord. Her devotional writings give us insight into how hard her life was, but that she was able to remain peaceful and patient because of the practices that she fostered, okay? The practices that she fostered that allowed her to keep her focus on her God and her Savior. Here's just a couple excerpts that speak to my heart. Oh God, I find it most difficult to pr preserve a devout and serious temper of mind in the midst of much worldly business. If that doesn't speak to the temptation of our busy world, help me, O oh Lord, to make a true use of all disappointments and calamities in this life in such a way that they may unite my heart more closely with yours. May I give way, this might give us a little picture even into her experience as she went through all this loss watching others prosper. May I give way to no direct murmurings, no repinings at the prosperity of others. Save me from thinking severely or unjustly of others, from being too much dejected or disposed to peevishness, covetedness, or negligence in my affairs. And as a lonely mama, we hear her cry out to the Lord, enable me to live so as to deserve a friend. And if I never have one on earth, be my friend, for in having you, I have all that is dear and valuable in friendship. What a foreign thing for us in this day and age of constant access to people, information, friends, 
How many of you have recently gone through your phone or your Facebook account or other social media and God, do I even, do I know those people? Do, are those my friends? Right, she's on the other side going, Lord, give me one friend, just one. So the question today, what are the practices that you are sowing into your life that are drawing you closer to the Lord, that are allowing you to receive and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit like a tree that has gone through fall and seasons of letting go and loss and through winter where it looked dead but there was deep work happening. In the beginning, maybe the the hope of life that you think is coming, expectations for things and then the fruit that eventually is born. What practices are you putting into your life? Like, honestly, I want you to take a minute. This is not rhetorical. I want you to think about the last week. I've always heard you can, you can know your priorities by looking at your calendar and your checkbook, right? How did you choose to spend yourself this last week? How much time did you choose to read the word instead of that fantastic book that has been just grabbing you? How much time did you spend praying versus that Netflix show that's really intriguing? (laughs) Certainly has some redemptive purpose in it. How much time did you spend confessing this week one to another your sins and where you've fallen short that the Lord might cleanse you white as snow? and wash you in righteousness. Maybe it's, did you make the choice to be together in community, but were you able to be fully in community? Did you bring your true, authentic self that allows iron to sharpen iron? What are the practices that lead to peace and patience? Now that apron may have given away, some of you may know who I'm talking about with Susanna Wesley. It's a pretty common story of her, how she would throw her, her apron over her head to, you know, shut out the world. From this book, from the biography of seven women, Eric Metaxas says, few human beings have influenced the world as Susanna Wesley did. The manner in which she taught her children greatly influenced the work of her son, John. The Methodist movement he founded led to world-changing revival and to such an array of social reforms as can never be calculated. The abolition of the slave trade, and slave trade and slavery are at the top of a long list that includes prison reform, the end of child labor in England, laws against cruelty to animals, the establishment of countless private societies and organizations dedicated to the care of the poor and the suffering. The Methodist movement claims over 80 million members around the world, along with obviously many hospitals, orphanages, colleges. And more than 375 years after her death, we sing of one of her son's hymns that he wrote every Christmas, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Her son Charles wrote that. And here's just a picture of Susanna, because I think this is interesting. This is one of the old rectories that they lived in for part of her life. And I ask you again, what practices are you fostering that no matter what season you're in, whether it's a season of shriveled leaves and things being ripped from your branches, or what appears to be death and slow, slow, cold existence, or hope that is bursting forth into life, What are you fostering right where you are today? And I just want to share one more picture because this is um, (laughs) this little plant. If you know me, I sometimes refer myself, refer to myself as hospice for plants. Like I just shepherd them right to Jesus. And um, I do. It's, and I am comfortable and I own it and I try every year. Like this is going to be different this year. And this year, this plant was gorgeous. I got it at like one of those wholesale places that was like huge and full of life. And I was like, yes, we are going to do it. And then it snowed in May. And I forgot about my plants. And I went outside and I went, oh, no, my plants. 
And this one looked really, really, really bad. You can see it only has like five little strips of the, uh, you know, I don't know, the stuff that doesn't, I don't even know what it is. The spiky stuff that's supposed to stay alive through anything. And then there were the flowers and we came back from our being gone for two weeks and it was all brown. It was so sad. And I was like, I guess it's time to throw it out. And then I, I literally, I do my quiet time and my silence outside and I, I kind of looked at it and I went, oh, I think it can come back. I do. So I went and I, you know, I took all the dead stuff off and I pruned it off and I, and, and this, and this week, this week, I got four little areas of flowers that showed up in the midst of, you can still see some of the dead. Like I couldn't even, I don't even know how to trim it right. So it still is there. But it gave me such a picture. Every time I see it, these little flowers give me such joy to know that even when there are things that feel not full of life, that when we tend to them and we care and we nourish, that sometimes we see the flowers come. Sometimes we see the fruit come. So as I've been praying for this morning, worship team, I'll just invite you back up. I thought it might be helpful to be reminded of that plant, my poor brown, mostly brown, dead plant that I really had desire to grow, but I had to do some things for that to happen. I had to allow those things that were shriveled and dead to go away and be pruned off. And I had to water and nurture and add some nutrients and do some some practices around bringing those flowers forth, which I mean, I still obviously didn't do much for. But the picture sticks, right? So I'm just gonna pray that as we close in worship, that the Lord would speak to you of the different seasons in your own life the things where you have looked to the world or to your circumstances or the chaos or the things that are very pressing and you would take your apron and you would throw it over your head and you would say, Lord, help me to find peace. Lord, grow in me the fruit of every calamity and disappointment. Lord, that you may do whatever it is that you desire to do in my life because I seriously doubt Susanna would have called herself the mother of the Methodists. I'm sure she had no idea what the Lord would take from this faithful woman who just kept saying yes and just kept doing the work, kept practicing over and over again. So will you stand while we worship? And if you'd like to respond, we'll have people available in the back during the last worship song to pray with you. At the end of service, we'll have some people up here. We've got our cross and communion. Don't allow the heaviness of this world, the heaviness of your circumstances, the, just the disappointments of this life to derail you today and this week and what it is that the Lord has to grow and develop and gift to you that you might reflect him to this world. So Father, we say yes. We say yes to the great and the deep and the hard work that you're doing in each of our lives. We say yes to a surrender that recognizes there are things that we need to lay down. There are choices, Father, that we, some really terrible choices and some really good choices, Lord, but they're not your best. Lord, where your grace and your forgiveness says all things are permissible, Lord, help us to remember not all things are beneficial. And Lord, would you speak to each person right now, what is the best that you have? What is the apron in their life that they need to throw over their head? What are the leaves that they need to not just allow to let go, Father, but they need to go and and prune and strip and take out. Father, we say, have your way with willing hearts. Thank you for this community of believers. Thank you, Father, that we journey together in a gift of fellowship. And we trust you. We trust your goodness. Thank you, Lord.